We've all heard of Norma Desmond, the fictional character played to perfection by Gloria Swanson in Sunset Boulevard, but do you know where the name comes from? Well, Norma comes from silent film star Mabel Norman, and Desmond comes from William Desmond Taylor, one of Hollywood's first important directors. This was an homage to the silent film era, part of a theme in Sunset Boulevard, and they both happen to be central figures in today's story, and I happen to be standing in the exact same spot they both once stood. Now, I know it's hard to imagine, but this basic-looking parking lot on Alvarado Street in a not-so-desirable neighborhood of Los Angeles was once the site of Hollywood's first murder mystery. Now, we're going to see more of it as our story unfolds, but 101 years ago, on this property, stood a handful of really beautiful bungalows occupied by some of Hollywood's most important players. You have to keep in mind, though, this was the very early days of Hollywood, but what makes this story location tour so fun is that while all of the players and all of the evidence are long gone, there are still a bunch of locations that exist, so we're going to see them all today. Now, the weather in LA is rainy, it's cold, it's dark, it's dreary, but so is our story. We've all heard of Hollywood and Vine right up the block there, but have you heard of Selma and Vine? It's where we're standing right now, and if you were to go inside of that Equinox gym, you would probably see a Hollywood actor or two going over their lines and reading their scripts while trotting away on a treadmill. It's kind of a common sight at LA gyms, and that kind of vibe has actually been going on right here for over a hundred years because we're looking at the former site of one of Hollywood's very first movie studios. But first, you have to go back to 1901 when this exact corner was occupied by a small little barn. The barn was part of an enormous, <laughs> get this, $10,000 estate built by a businessman investor for he and his new wife. The barn housed their horses as the estate covered the entire block of Vine Street down from Hollywood Boulevard, which back then was called Prospect Avenue. A few years later, the house was sold to a real estate developer who used the barn for storage. Now, around 1909, as the film industry was really beginning to take shape on the East Coast, more and more producers and filmmakers were migrating to the West Coast to escape the cold weather and take advantage of Southern California's weather. The new owner, he wanted to take advantage of this booming industry, so he rented out his barn to a man named Cecil B. DeMille, who was eager to direct his very first film. And on December 29th, 1913, Mr. DeMille, along with his co-director, Oscar Apfel, began shooting The Squaw Man, Hollywood's very first full-length feature film. The movie, produced by the Jesse Lasky Feature Play Company, was a huge hit and grossed $250,000, a fortune back then. Well, Adolf Zukor, who ran Famous Players, another production company, struck a deal with Jesse Lasky in the summer of 1916, and the two formed Famous Players Lasky. Rather than compete, Zucker wanted to team up. Today, you know their company is Paramount Pictures, but before it turned into Paramount, this little barn and its productions had to grow. More and more movies began to film here, but it wasn't enough. So Famous Players Lasky took the nine acres stretching down to Sunset Boulevard and created a full-fledged film studio much like the ones that you're accustomed to seeing today with back lots that are made to look like cities and old-timey western saloons. So with all this growth, their little barn would now be used to store props. We're, we're going to walk south down Vine Street to Sunset Boulevard, but I'm not sure how far we're going to get because it's really starting to rain now. But I just want to give you an idea how large this city block is and just how large Famous Players Lasky was, physically, but also universally. I mean, they made like 20-some movies in their first year alone. Adolf Zukor, he was all about the studio star system, this idea of making celebrities out of film stars. 
and they eventually boasted having a roster that included their biggest star, Mary Pickford, as well as Rudolph Valentino, Gloria Swanson, Mary Miles Minter, and Clara Bow, to name the more remembered ones. Now, the reason you don't hear much about Famous Players Lasky anymore and why it's such a forgotten piece of history is because there was eventually a merger with Paramount, and by the end of the 1920s, people stopped using the Famous Players Lasky name, simply calling it Paramount. And not only that, but they built new studios on a whole new lot a little more south and a little more east at 5555 Melrose Avenue, where it still stands today. All right, we made it down to sunset. The rain just keeps stopping and starting. So while there's a little break, I'll show you something kind of cool in a minute. But Famous Players Lasky, it stretched all the way down here to Sunset Boulevard. And in fact, right here on the corner where this fountain now sits was Mary Pickford's dressing room. This side of Vine Street back then, it was just lined with trees and a long row of wooden buildings that stretched north up to Selma. Cecil B. DeMille's office, it was right about where that person is walking, and next to his office were the director's offices, one of whom was one of the top directors here, William Desmond Taylor, the subject of our story today. He frequented the Nine Acre lot that covered from Selma down here to Sunset and then Vine here east to El Centro Avenue, two really big, large city blocks. This Chase Bank was built in 1968, long after Famous Players Lasky was demolished. In fact, after it was demolished, NBC brought their radio empire out here and they built their West Coast division right here. That too eventually saw the old wrecking ball and in 1968 we got what we're seeing today. The fountain is apparently a depiction of Europa riding Zeus in bull form. I'm not really into mythology, so I'm not sure what the symbolism is there, but I do know that this mural pays tribute to the yesteryear of Hollywood. There are 16 actors in memorable roles depicted, as well as 480 names of people who contributed greatly to the world of cinema. Some of the names are of superstars, people you would certainly recognize, as well as people who for the most part, are largely forgotten and rarely talked about. What I love, though, is that the bank and artist, they at least acknowledge that we're on one of the most important and, in my opinion, sacred pieces of land in Hollywood. I mean, <laughs> you have to come over to the highest point possible to even learn that, and you need a telescope to read it, but hey... At least it's here, I guess. I mean, it's really nice, but I just feel like there should be a statue or a plaque out on the sidewalk or on the street or something. But what's fun about this mural is that it has the names of two people we're mentioning in today's story. The first, none other than Mabel Norman. I mean, she's really one of the stars of our story. And the other one, I think, was... Yeah, over here, right under Gloria Swanson. Edna Perviance. <laughs> Mabel and Edna, two key players to the story, and also two first names you just really don't hear anymore. Mabel Norman, I mean, really, she was one of the biggest stars of her day. You're going to learn a lot about her. And there are surprisingly a lot of physical markers or landmarks remembering her around L.A., which we'll, of course, visit. But this is it as far as any, I don't know, sort of indication of the history that happened here, this mural. Everything else has been destroyed. Well, except for one thing, one very big thing. The barn I mentioned, where it all began the seed that grew into famous players Lasky? Well, Jesse Lasky and Adolf Zukor had it transported from here to the new Paramount lot on Melrose for good luck when it opened. And that barn from 1901 is still standing today, but no longer at Paramount Pictures. 
If you've ever seen a show at the Hollywood Bowl over there, or even just driven along Highland Avenue, you may have noticed our little barn across the street here in the parking lot. It's really one of the only remaining places from William Desmond Taylor's career. Now, I told you he was one of the top directors at Famous Players Lasky, but he also got promoted to head of production. And in addition to that, he served as the president of the Motion Picture Directors Association for three terms, but that obviously didn't happen overnight. He was born in Carlow, Ireland on April 26, 1872. Now, he was very well educated. He attended college in England and eventually made his way to New York City. He had completely fallen in love with acting as a young boy. He got a taste of it in school. And while he was in New York, he met and married an actress named Ethel May Harrison. They had a daughter, Ethel Daisy, who was born in 1903. Now, his wife's father was very wealthy. He had an antique store in New York, and William worked for him. But in 1908, William completely up and vanishes, totally disappeared, ghosted on his wife and little girl. And the few years after he left, they're a little blurry, but the gist of it is he left New York to pursue his dreams of acting. Now, his wife, <laughs> this, is, this is just so silly. He used to have bouts of forgetfulness or amnesia, so he claimed. And she just chalked it up to William having one of his bouts, said he wandered off somewhere, which he did. He definitely wandered off, but he wandered to like Canada. I think he even went to Alaska. He went to San Francisco and eventually ended up here in Hollywood. And somewhere along the way, he joined an acting troupe. I mean, he really knew he wanted to be part of movie making. And around 1912, 1913, he started acting in movies. Some of them were for Vitagraph, an East Coast studio, and some of them were for Balboa Films, which was out this way in Long Beach. It's another long-forgotten studio that also employed Fatty Arbuckle and Buster Keaton. Now, in 1912, uh, four years after his disappearance, Ethel May files for divorce. She assumed she'd never see him again. Now, William acted in, like, 20 movies, and... Around 1914, he stepped behind the camera and completely fell in love with directing. For the next few years, he would direct around 50 movies. And in 1918, towards the end of World War I, he enlisted as a Canadian soldier and he was even stationed in Dunkirk. He did his part, then returns to Hollywood a year later in 1919 with Welcome Arms, the Motion Picture Directors Association, threw a huge party in his honor and after his return this is when his career really started to get hot he directed some of hollywood's biggest stars like wallace reed and of course mary pickford he directed around 60 movies by 1922 most of them for famous players lasky home of this barn and like i said earlier this barn was actually transferred from Selma and Vine to where Paramount sits today on Melrose. When it was moved there in 1926, it was used as a rehearsal studio and eventually served as the Studio Lots Gymnasium. The other plaque over here has some more photos from the past and talks about how it can be seen in the TV show Bonanza, as well as the film The Rainmaker, starring Katherine Hepburn and Burt Lancaster. Also, it was dedicated a historic landmark in 1956 and is the last remaining structure from famous Lasky players. Cecil B. DeMille and Jesse Lasky were both on hand for the dedication, but back to William Desmond Taylor, he had this reputation... Okay, so they called him the gentleman's director. Actors, actresses, all showbiz people had nothing but great things to say about working with him. He even kept an autographed headshot of Mary Pickford in his home that read, To my nice director, William Desmond Taylor, the most patient man I have ever known. Hollywood just, they loved working with him. Personal life, a lot messier. The sun is trying to come out. The clouds are relentless. I love this, though. The 
Hollywood Heritage Incorporation was founded in 1980 by five women who basically met doing volunteer work. They couldn't believe that there wasn't an organization for preserving and protecting old Hollywood buildings. They really worked their asses off and began, well, protecting and preserving. The people at Paramount, they had no use for this barn anymore. It was a nuisance to them, and by 1979, it was just sitting empty. So they donated it to the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce, where it was moved from Melrose over to Vine Street. It sat for a while in a parking lot near Capitol Records and remained boarded up on Vine Street until it was once again transported over here in 1982 after the Hollywood Heritage women acquired it. They spent a few years restoring it and turned it into a museum. There was a big dedication ceremony here. Charlton Heston was on hand and it's remained a museum to this day with a gift shop, memorabilia, souvenirs, books. They even have silent film screenings here. The funny thing is though, it's, it's been a museum for 38 years, much longer than it was ever a film studio. <laughs> If you were to leave the old famous player's Lasky lot on Vine Street, heading south until it dead ends, you'd end up right here on Wilshire in Hancock Park, where it turns into Fremont Place, a gated community, and that's just what Mary Miles Minter did when she lived here with her family as one of Hollywood's biggest child and teen stars. I actually wrote a letter to the owners of her former home asking if we could at least see the outside for this project, but didn't hear back. It's very private, and unfortunately, we can't get further than the gates here. But if we could, we would make a left and go about a block to 56 Fremont Place, where not only did Mary Miles Minter live, but prior to her, it was home to Mary Pickford. I swear, Mary Pickford owned and lived in every single house in L.A. until she died. Every house. <laughs> this one, it was built in 1915, and it's just over 8,000 square feet. It has six bedrooms, five baths, and two lion statues standing guard at the front door. Most all of the houses back here, they're giant, old, stately. Muhammad Ali, he actually lived back here, as did Angela Bassett at one point. The neighborhood still has as much prestige as it did back in the day, if not more. Actually, probably more. I mean, these houses are a fortune. Which is why Mary Miles Minter's house was featured in, and I'm not kidding when I say this, one of my all-time favorite movies, <laughs> Rocky IV. It's where Rocky and Adrian live with their son and giant robot servant, now that Rocky is a filthy rich superstar. But the house is also seen in a two-part episode of the best show ever, Charlie's Angels, season four. It really deserves its own tour because the list of productions is truly insane. Columbo, Chips, Murder, She Wrote, they used it like on three or four different episodes. It's been in all of those NCIS, CSI shows. It was on Weeds. It was on Lucifer. Oh, it's even in the Liam Neeson movie Taken. Just so many things. But in 1918, Mary Pickford lived here for a year with her mother and sister. Not so coincidentally, after she moved out, another Mary moved in with her mother and her sister, Mary Miles Minter. Now, this was because little Mary Miles Minter had an overbearing stage mom who wanted her to be the next Mary Pickford. In fact, Charlotte Shelby, she might be the very first villainous stage mother. She was born Lily Pearl Miles in Shreveport, Louisiana, and she grew up with her own aspirations of becoming an actress. She met an actor from Chicago named J. Homer Riley, with whom she had two children, Margaret and Juliet. But when Mr. Riley told her that she couldn't pursue her dream of becoming an actress, she knew there was only one thing she could become, an actress. She and Riley split, and she actually changed her name to Charlotte Shelby, 
and she took her little daughters, Juliet and Margaret, to Manhattan, and she actually landed a walk-on role as a maid on Broadway in Love Watches, starring Billy Burke, a.k.a. Glinda the Good Witch, in her first starring role. But her career was short-lived. However, producers kept noticing little Margaret and little Juliet and suggested they go into acting. Once Charlotte realized just how lucrative this could be for the family, she dropped her own career and started focusing on getting her daughters into the spotlight. Particularly little Margaret, who she blatantly favored over little Juliet. It frustrated Charlotte that Juliet was the natural one, the one who was more comfortable on stage. She was more in demand and even worked her way to the Broadway stage. In 1911, Little Juliet landed a large role in The Littlest Rebel, which ran for three years on Broadway, in addition to a traveling tour of it. But when it came time to play in Chicago, there was a hitch. Juliet was 12, and there was an Illinois law at the time that prevented any child under 14 from working. So clever Charlotte obtained a copy of her niece's birth certificate, who had tragically died eight years earlier. Had her niece lived, she would have been 16 years old. Charlotte issued a press release that Juliet Shelby was quitting the play to go to school and that her role would be recast with a 16-year-old actress named Mary Miles Minter. Little Juliet was no more. And from now on, she would live under the name of her deceased cousin. This is just, I mean, it's stuff that you could only get away with in this time period. It would never work. Never in a million years today. Before she changed her name, little Juliet appeared in a film in 1912 when she was just 10 years old, but then went right back into theater. However, at 13, she was outgrowing the littlest rebel role, and once again, film producers came knocking. Of course, Charlotte jumped at the chance to make her daughter a film star, so... At 13 years old, Mary Miles Minter signed with Metro Pictures and kicked off her film career with a six-picture deal in 1915. But you have to remember, Hollywood, it wasn't really yet a big thing. It was still so new that Metro was only operating on the East Coast and in Florida, which is where Mary shot all of her first six movies. Metro, they were going to make another six when Hungry Mom Charlotte stepped in and negotiated a new contract for Little Mary at Flying A Studios, one of the biggest studios in motion pictures. Flying A, they were located in Santa Barbara. And in May of 1916, Mary Miles Minter, along with her mom and sister, arrived on the West Coast, already an established actress, ready to rival Mary Pickford. Mary Miles Minter went on to make 26 films for Flying A over the course of four years and became the studio's top star. She became such a big star that in 1919 now calling themselves Paramount Pictures, nabbed her because Mary Pickford was leaving and Paramount just couldn't be without a Mary. Charlotte Shelby knew this and negotiated an outrageous contract for her daughter. She got Adolf Zukor to guarantee Mary $1.3 million for 20 movies. Again, this was 1919, and back then... Stars would, they would churn out about five to ten pictures a year, but still, it was a lot. And by today's standards, it's somewhere around $20 million, which is how Charlotte Shelby got this house. Mary Miles Minter, she was a household name, and her first film for Paramount was going to make her even a bigger star, as she would be playing the lead in the very first film adaptation of the now classic book, Anne of Green Gables. Her director would be William Desmond Taylor. Meanwhile, about seven miles away from the old famous player's Lasky lot, here on Glendale Boulevard sits another somewhat preserved gem in what used to be Edendale, now called Echo Park. You're looking at the birthplace of Flapstick the birthplace of film comedy, the place where Charlie Chaplin had one of his first jobs, the former site of Max Sennett's Keystone Studios, now declared a historical landmark on a public storage property. (laughs) 
Uh, this one-time film studio, I guess, now houses people's belongings. However, they are not allowed to touch the outside, so that's good, I guess. But I don't know. It's just... It's insane to me that something this incredible isn't better preserved, like a museum or a screening room or something, but at least they do have a sign here acknowledging the old studios. An unsmiling king presides over his loony domain, a rugged gray-maned king who has already ridden the escalator of success from Boilermaker to chief of the first laugh factory, the father of American screen comedy, Max Sennett. The young woman working was nice enough to let me come in and film here. She's the one who told me they aren't allowed to touch the outside of this building, which, along with Keystone Studios, was founded on the 4th of July in 1912. You're, you're looking at the very first totally enclosed soundstage, the Fun Factory, as it was called. And why not? Max Sennett was known as the king of comedy. He was a Canadian-American multi-hyphenated man. He was an actor, a writer, a director, a producer, a ladies' man, you name it. But all that began on the East Coast. And while he was at Biograph Studios, he met actress Mabel Norman. She had been born on November 9th, 1893 in Staten Island. She was a New Yorker who actually couldn't wait to grow up and get off the island to make it to the big city. And that's exactly what she did. She started modeling as a teenager for photographers and advertisers. Most impressively, she modeled a brand new bottled beverage called (laughs) Coca-Cola. This actually led to acting, and in 1911, she got her very first leading role in a movie directed by D.W. Griffith. This turned 18-year-old Mabel into a star who really everyone loved. She was funny, she was witty, and she could hang with the guys because, well, she gave it just as rough and tough as they did. I mean, some of the things that came out of her mouth just shocked those around her, but it always got a laugh. And she loved practical jokes. I mean, everyone wanted to be around Mabel. She could captivate an entire room with her charm, and she captivated Max Sennett. He convinced her to leave the East Coast and join him out west at his soon-to-be-opened Keystone Studios in 1912. Mabel packed up her life and joined Mac out here in Edendale. He wanted her as his leading lady, and the two of them made movie magic together. But what's fascinating is Mabel saw herself more as a director, and that was one of the unique things about these studios, having a female who not only acted but directed. I mean, she's really the pioneer, not just the first female comedian, but one of the first comedians. I'm not, well, I'm not talking generally, I'm talking about film. I specifically mean in film. She's one of the first. She made at least over 160 short films in her career, directed by various people. She and Mac made a bunch together. She and Roscoe Arbuckle, or Fatty as they called him, they became an instantly popular screen duo. Then, Charlie Chaplin enters the picture, he signs with Keystone, and not only does Mabel direct him and them together, but she basically teaches him how to direct, something that even Max Sennett stated. And get this, in 1914, Mabel stars alongside Charlie Chaplin with Marie Dressler in the very first full-length feature comedy ever made. The very first It was called Tilly's Punctured Romance. And on top of that, she's in the... You you always see these iconic... I know, it's the most overused word, but they truly are iconic clips. The woman tied to the train tracks? Mabel Norman. 
the woman getting the first pie in her face on camera, Mabel Norman. She's just an integral component in the early success of cinema. For those who don't know the show, This Is Your Life, it was an old show that would basically ambush a celebrity and present them with people from their past. Absolutely horrifying. <laughs> they would bring as many people into the hour-long show as possible, taking the celebrity down memory lane. And they did an episode for Max Sennett in 1954, and some of the people who were still alive were on hand to pay tribute to him. The show also presented him with this plaque honoring this very location. Apparently, though, the plaque was incorrectly placed at another building, which all of this explains, but it was rightfully brought here where it belongs, thanks in part to our friends over at the Hollywood Heritage Museum, fittingly enough. But I love that they give credit to Mabel Norman here, because seriously, without her, I don't think the Max Sennett Keystone Studios would have done nearly as well as they did. Max Sennett, in addition to being credited for giving Mabel and Chaplin and Arbuckle their start, is also responsible for kicking off the careers of Bing Crosby, Harold Lloyd, Carol Lombard, and our dear friend Gloria Swanson. Carol and Gloria, they were two of Max's bathing beauties, a bevy of women who would just parade around in bathing suits doing silly things. The Keystone Cops, they also became an identifying trademark of Senate's, and their popularity grew after starring in a short film alongside, guess who? Yep, Mabel Norman. The studios, they actually had a long list of very talented, extremely funny, yet forgotten names. You know, very few of the shorts and even the full-length features of the silent era have survived. So many were lost over time, and in fires and moves, but mostly they were lost intentionally. Films, they would be shown in limited run at theaters, much like they are today, but then they would be thrown away because nobody had any idea that there would ever be a place for them to be seen again. I mean, that's just a wild thing to wrap your head around. You had to see these movies the month they came out, and that was it. Their future had absolutely no value. This is just a fantastic viewpoint to see where the old studios once were because there's this really great old photo that, well, I'm sure you're looking at it now after I've edited all of this together, but you can really see just what Edendale looked like back then and how much it's changed. Really wish it was still called Edendale. I don't know, I love that name. There just seems to be such a prestige to it. And you can actually see so much of Edendale in these old movies. Keystone used nearby houses and streets and hills. Really, they just kept their productions as close to the studio as possible. It's really fun to watch some of those old movies. You can spot Glendale Boulevard, which back then was called Alessandro Street. And you can see Aaron Street, Alvarado Street, Effie, all these streets that still exist. And I'm not entirely clear on why the name Edendale vanished. The story I heard was that the Edendale line, the train line, closed down and with no train stop anymore, everyone just started calling the area Echo Park after Echo Park Lake, which is just a few minutes away. But really the only thing that still uses the Edendale name is the post office here, which is officially called the Edendale Station. Oh, and there's actually a nice restaurant here called Edendale. We are on the complete opposite side of where we just were, now looking down on top of the old Fun Factory studio. So Mac and Mabel, they were more than colleagues. They fell in love. They had an extremely intense up and down, on again, off again relationship. Mabel, she wanted the ring, even kids, and Mac wanted none of that. He truly loved her, but he loved women, lots of women. And at one point, while they were engaged to be married, Mabel found Mac in bed with another woman. But not just any woman, Mabel's best friend, actress Mae Bush. Mabel was 
obviously devastated. She was pissed. She was angry. There's even a story that May actually picked up a vase and hurled it at Mabel when she caught them. Mabel did show up at work with bandages, and there became a story that maybe she even tried to kill herself. Either way, Keystone released a statement saying that Mabel was taking a little time off because of an injury she sustained during a stunt. Whatever the truth is, Mabel did step back from all of this for a while, and she even went to the East Coast with Fatty Arbuckle to make some movies. And Mac, he... He was actually just ridden with guilt. He felt terrible. Like I said, he loved her, but just not enough to be tied down. Anyway, I find this kind of spooky. We are, we're actually walking on Alvarado Street, the same Alvarado Street where I started this tour, where our parking lot now sits. We're a few miles away from it in a completely different neighborhood, but it's the same Alvarado, the one that Mabel Normand had no idea would play such a vital role in the rest of her life. Just over two miles away here in Silver Lake sits another historical triangle-shaped building that, in my opinion, is erroneously named. It's actually called the Mac Senate Studios, and their website, they boast an incredible list of people who have used it recently, like Martin Scorsese and David Lynch, uh, Justin Bieber, Natalie Portman, uh, John C. Riley, Lady Gaga, Jay-Z, to name a few. This was built in 1916, and it was built by Max Senate, but it was built for Mabel Norman. I told you, he felt so guilty for the affair with Mae Bush that he built this studio for Mabel to really direct whatever the hell she wanted. He gave her her own studio with her name on it. She ran it. He was determined to win her over again, and he made her name on the building so huge so that the entire city of Los Angeles would know just who was in charge here. Mabel made one of her biggest hits here, 1918's Mickey. It took two years to get released, and it was plagued with all sorts of issues, but the public just could not get enough of it. However, the studio did not last long, with the whole Mickey fiasco. On top of the residual feelings with Mac, Mabel left Keystone, and she signed with Sam Goldwyn, who ironically was brothers-in-law with Jesse Lasky. Mabel, she wanted to get away from slapstick. She felt that it had run its course, and she wanted more intelligent comedy. No more pratfalls or pies in her face. She wanted to refine her comedic skills, and Sam Goldwyn was on the exact same page. Or was he just smitten with her? Because they too began an affair, and Mabel eventually miscarried Sam's baby. The affair crumbled shortly after that, I think she made 16 films with Goldwyn, of which only one or two exist today. But in 1920, Mabel, whose career was on the decline, decided to return to Max Senate and make what was touted as her giant comeback film, 
Molly O. The film was a box office hit, however, it had the unfortunate luck to be released in November of 1921. The problem there is that two months before, Hollywood was stricken with a terrible scandal involving Mabel's pal and frequent co-star Fatty Arbuckle. Fatty and some friends, they partied too hard in San Francisco one night. An actress named Virginia Rapay was present, and it's not entirely clear what happened. There are several accounts, but the fact is Virginia died four days later from a ruptured bladder. This led to accusations that Fatty had raped her, and that his excessive weight crushed her bladder. I mean, it sounds pretty insane, but that was the main story, and it only escalated. Rumors swirled that he even used a broomstick or a wine bottle on her, and that it was just the craziest, wildest party you have ever heard about. Well, Arbuckle was arrested and went to trial, right when Molly O came out, and really nobody wanted anything to do with show business the public, they were outraged over the Fatty Arbuckle story. And it was now prohibition, so the fact that Fatty and his friends had alcohol, oh, that made them just absolute sinners and terrible criminals in the eyes of the public. And they saw the industry as an immoral cesspool. Fatty Arbuckle was eventually acquitted, with the jury even saying that acquittal was not enough. They said a huge injustice had been done and that he should be completely exonerated. But by that time, his career was ruined. His films had been banned all over the country, and really, he would never rebound. He was, however, so thrilled and touched by the extra step that the jury took, and he even kept the piece of paper that they read their statement from for the rest of his life. It was hard for Mabel to celebrate the acquittal with her pal because just two months earlier, in February, Mabel had now become embroiled in a scandal far greater than Fatty's, one that was simultaneously battling his scandal for front page headlines. After Mabel Norman Studios went under, this place became William Hart's studio. It switched names and owners multiple times over the years, but in 2013, the new owners wanted to restore its name to honor its origins, which is why it should be named the Mabel Norman Studios. Max Sennett didn't do anything in here. She did. There is a speakeasy inside called Mabel's, but honestly, it should be the other way around. Mabel should have the name, and Mac, he can have the bar. But then again, none of the things I've told you about Mabel Normand are the things that she's remembered for. She's mostly remembered as being a reckless party girl with an immense drug problem. And the fact is, there's just not a whole lot of evidence to back this up. Did she drink? Yes. Did she do cocaine? Probably and yes, but so did everyone. She wasn't alone in this. Several of her contemporaries loved the white powder, but... Her use of it is much, much more talked about than any of her pals, especially the men. They always say that Mabel ran with a fast crowd. Well, she also ran with a highly intelligent crowd, including William Desmond Taylor, her really good friend. Mabel was spending a lot of time with Billy, as she referred to him, with the Arbuckle trial happening and her career woes and the miscarriage, she found Billy to be a much needed, calm, and centered presence. Taylor was educated. Mabel was not. He introduced her to literature, to poetry, to art. He loved all of the same things that everyone else loved about Mabel, but he, he saw her differently. He saw her intellect, and he was one of the few men who didn't use her or take advantage of her. This angle is great. You can really see the triangle shape. Anyway, whether or not they may have slept together, I don't think anyone knows for sure. But the truth is, William and Mabel were not lovers. Rumors would certainly fly suggesting that they were, but the truth is, they shared a special bond that Mabel had never shared with another man. He was 20 years her senior, and he really cast a father figure shadow over her. I mean, at first quick glance, this could look like Mac and Mabel, but it's not. This mural is called American Dreamers. It was painted in 2018, and according to the artist, it depicts the challenges of visiting America versus becoming a resident here. 
Anyway, Mabel, she just continued to soak up the education that William Desmond Taylor was providing for her. His home was like a library for her. She found such comfort sitting in his warm, cozy bungalow as they would read passages and excerpts together. It was like having her very own professor. In this relationship, she was addicted to knowledge and Billy was her dealer. He saw things in her that really no other man paid attention to and it just catapulted her to cloud nine. Taylor, he, you know, felt the same way about her. He even kept a signed headshot of her above his desk, something that he would look at every single day. She never loved him the way she loved Max Sennett, and this could be for several reasons, and perhaps the reasons are secret. Perhaps that's what drew them to one another. They're secrets. Maybe Mabel knew something about Billy that he didn't share with many other people. After the success of Molly O, Max Sennett went right back to work on a follow-up picture with Mabel, a big-budget costume romantic comedy called Susanna, set in the Old West. And one night, during some time off from shooting, Mabel paid Billy Taylor a visit at home. Earlier in the day, he had bought a book for her at Robinson's department store downtown, and the two made plans for her to pick it up from his home that night. But what happens next is probably much more intriguing than anything that was in that book. Mm -hmm. 